Can we get one more round of applause for all the organizers? So that was actually a sarcastic applause. Thank you so much because the organizers were like, hey, Ryan, can you come talk to this audience about how to not get an infectious disease? And what we're going to do is pack 300 people into a really small room. <laughs> and what we'll also do is have them breathe real heavy after each talk. Like, don't... <laughs> Do not do that, okay? <laughs> so yeah, I have the enviable task of telling you guys uh, about the things that can kill not only you, but the entire human species. Uh, if you ask experts, they'll say, maybe it's gonna be something big, right? This is science fiction stuff. This is kind of stuff where we say as humans, we had a good run, but guess what? Asteroid hit, we're dead. Or solar flare, of course, Godzilla. But if you ask a biologist, hey, how realistic are these? Well, maybe, they're, maybe there's a, a small chance. But a biologist knows that there's much smaller things that are already here on planet Earth that can wipe out the entire species. These things win in terms of thinking small. There are about a thousand of these things can fit on the width of a human hair, and you need about 10 or 15 of them, those little particles, to make you very sick or die. Um, so these are things called infectious diseases. They're viruses, bacteria, and protozoans. And by infectious disease, I just mean something that you can contract from, from someone else or from an insect vector. So uh, these look like they're straight out of science fiction, right? They're on planet Earth. Their entire goal is to replicate and invade your body and kill you, okay? So it's a war. It's a war going on out there. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll be a little more prepared. I'm sorry, hypochondriacs, this is not a good talk for you. <laughs> this is a list of the diseases that have hit, crossed international boundaries within the last 10 years. So some of these probably seem, or you've heard of before, Ebola, you know about the measles outbreak recently. Uh, Chagas, terrifying disease. You probably may have not heard of that one. Uh, Google that later, that's a, that's a real, or ask me about it at the after party. Scary, scary stuff. <laughs> But these include, these include things that are direct transmission from human to human, things like Ebola, um, things like avian influenza that you can get from another person. They also include things that you get from an insect, so things like malaria or West Nile virus. Let me give you some evidence to suggest what killers these are. This was a study um, conducted in 2010 showing the percent of yearly deaths in humans caused by various things. And so you can see infectious diseases are 15% right behind cardiovascular disease. To give you another sort of reference point, neoplastic diseases are all cancers. So we know cancer is a big deal, but it's half as big a deal as infectious diseases are. All right, the, the rules of the game used to be that developed countries, affluent countries had cardiovascular disease and neoplastic disease. That, those were the number one killers. Uh, and you had tropical diseases, areas in tropical, low-income areas, underdeveloped areas were places where a lot of people died from infectious diseases. But we don't have those rules anymore. And here's why. This video shows you the 90,000 flights that occur every single day across the globe. So I love this video because it looks like those are diseases, right? <laughs> like you can imagine them like, oh, don't go over there, disease. It's terrifying, right? Imagine all the people on there. You know you've been on the plane where somebody's sneezing or coughing. You're like, no, no, where, where did you come from? <laughs> all right, this is brand new to human civilization. If you believe the science, humans have been around for 200,000 years. This is the last 100 years. This is a video of commercial flights in 1914. And this video is not broken. There were zero commercial flights <laughs> in 1914. In fact, February of 2014, we, we marked 100 years of commercial flight uh, history, uh, the, the, uh, the anniversary. And so think about that. For 190,000 years and 900 years, we, we've been living without this global possibility of transport of disease. And only in the last 100 years how are we now faced with these, these brand new global transports. Now, one of these fateful flights is uh, near and dear to my heart. It's a case of West Nile virus. So somewhere in the Middle East, a plane came over and landed in JFK Airport in 1999. 
And that's why that New York is lit up red. That was the first human case of West Nile virus in North America. We have never been exposed to this disease before, and in 1999, we're now exposed to it. And in four years' time, it spread across the, the continent. I'm ignoring Mexico and Canada here. I apologize. We're just U.S.-focused. It's horrible. But across the continent, right, coast to coast in four years' time. Uh, and then people heard about West Nile virus. I, I think most people had heard about it in the room. It's a brand new disease. You hear people can get sick. It's a nasty disease. It's a central nervous system disease. So you get brain swelling and spinal uh, pains, uh, it, terrible pains. It's not a good way to go out. And you don't even make the news. At least if you get Ebola, you're going to be in the news, right? <laughs> so this isn't a good thing. People have forgot about West Nile virus. But here's what West Nile virus looked like in 2012. It's here. 2012 was the worst year for West Nile virus since the outbreak year. And it's everywhere. Southern California is a hot spot, the Northeast is a hot spot, and Texas had over 44% of the cases in 2012. And we'll get back to that. All right, I just want to explain to you the West Nile virus transmission cycle. First of all, this is not to scale. That would be terrifying. <laughs> My idea worth spreading there would be stay in your house, buy a shotgun. <laughs> Those mosquitoes are huge. Okay. All right, so that's not to scale. That mosquito infects a crow or another type of bird. Crows have been implicated in West Nile virus. And if a mosquito that is, doesn't have West Nile virus bites that bird again, it can get West Nile virus. So that's the, called the primary transmission cycle. We as humans or as horses, look at that human over there. It might be male or female. I don't really know. If he gets hit, he, she gets hit with West Nile virus, they cannot spread it. So we're considered dead-end secondary hosts. This is the worst thing ever. We're not even part of the real biological cycle and we're dying from this. So we're, we're just incidental contact and we have all these cases. It's thought there's hundreds of thousands of cases of West Nile virus every year and typically you just get fever-like symptoms or a headache and then you clear it. Um, but it, it's, it's a big problem. And it's a problem we've lived with for a long time. Uh, just to reiterate that point, uh, does anyone know who this is? No, it's not me, says some beautiful girl in the front row. You couldn't hear her, <laughs> but she said it. Uh, this, is, this is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, you know, everybody knows, he's great, right? That's why he has the name, 300 BC, conquered all of Macedonia. He came back from Babylon, did not die of war wounds or anything like that. He developed a fever and headaches. Uh, and he came up, or there's a quote that followed his death that said, when he arrived before the walls of the city, he saw a large number of ravens flying about and pecking one another, and some of them fell dead in front of him. Well, West Nile virus had been associated with crows, so this led some re researchers to write a peer-reviewed uh, paper that suggested that perhaps Alexander the Great died. He's the first historical case of West Nile virus. Now, there's not a lot of evidence. If you, if you put in a Wikipedia search for Alexander the Great, it's listed as a possible cause of death. I, I was a bit dubious about it. I didn't really believe it until I took a much closer look at this picture. If you look right up by his sword, everybody focused up there? There is a mosquito there. <laughs> so it's possible that we've been living with this disease for at least as long as baby Jesus has been alive. All right, that's silly. Let's talk about where West Nile virus might be in the future. This is a horrible map. This scares the crap out of me, and I study this stuff, okay? This represents every possible place you could find a mosquito that transmits West Nile virus, just in the U.S. and Canada. And so this is not a very good predictive map for us, right? Because it's just like, again, my recommendation is just stay indoors. Never leave your house. Because you can't tell where's a hot spot and where you, know, where, where you might be safe in, in this map. And so this was our first attempt at looking at, okay, here's where we might see West Nile virus. But that was about eight years ago or nine years ago, and we've come a long way. Last year, I, I produced this map in a paper, uh, and let me walk you through this. This is a predictive risk map for West Nile virus. Now, I want you to just focus on the colors here. The green means you're A-OK -okay for West Nile virus or lo much lower risk. Red is a much higher risk for West Nile virus. That map, the colored part of that map, was made f using data from 2002 to 2011. So we looked at previous cases of West Nile virus, and we said, hey, where do we see the disease a lot? And then we tried to predict where we might see it in 2012. So the white circles here 
are your 2012 human cases of West Nile virus. And we do a pretty darn good job of predicting where we might see it. You can see, and the circle sizes are proportional to how many cases you had. So you can see the, the numbers over there. We do a great job in Southern California where we predicted a hot spot. We do a good job in, nor in the Northeast. However, in Texas, we only predicted a moderate amount of West Nile virus. And here are all the counties that had West Nile virus cases in Texas. So we, we underpredicted in, in Texas. We were like, what's going on in Texas? Dallas-Fort Worth area particularly got hit so hard. And then, lo and behold, a news agency, Dallas-Fort Worth, NBC5, shout out. I don't know why I'm doing that. I don't <laughs> have any affiliation with them at all. Uh, they uncovered the fact that the vector control agencies in the Dallas-Fort Worth area bought no larvicide. They bought no way to control mosquitoes in 2010, 2011, and only very late in the season in 2012, once the CDC got involved and said, hey guys, uh, it's a real problem down here. And this brings me to sort of a first take-home point. I have a couple of messages for you guys, but this is one of them. Know what's going on with your tax dollars in terms of vector control agencies. LA has a wonderful vector, Los Angeles County has a wonderful vector control agency. Uh, Orange County, the Southern California area in general, you can make a call and have them come and do mosquito control for free. It's your tax dollars. So know what's going on. Know what's being sprayed in your area. Know how you can naturally control mosquito populations. Don't just let these guys spend money on whatever. Get active and, and determine where that money is going. Now, if we throw money at the problem, is, is that the, the solution? Here's a map of Orange County, uh, and let me walk you through this. The red areas, again, are areas of high West Nile virus. That dark red, that's right, Disneyland. Sorry, Disneyland, bad for, bad for measles and West Nile virus, right? The green areas are areas of lower West Nile virus. And we did everything we could. We threw the book at this in terms of like, how can we determine where we see, why do we see these patterns in Orange County, California? We looked at temperature. It's hot as hell everywhere in Orange County, California <laughs> in the summer months. We looked at precipitation. It doesn't rain at all. So as biologists, we were scratching our heads thinking, what, what's going on here? And then we found out this interesting relationship. So this is the relationship between per capita income in your neighborhood and the amount of West Nile virus you have in it. Okay, let that sink in. If you got a ton of money, you don't get West Nile virus. So we thought, oh, what's going on here? Is it possible that maybe uh, people with more income have high, uh, air conditions? They're not, they're maybe, maybe low income areas, people are sleeping outdoors. Maybe they have their screens open. What's going on here? The problem is that West Nile virus amount on the y-axis there is in mosquitoes, not in humans. So we had to throw out all of our hypotheses about humans. And we said, what is it about low-income areas that are causing higher amounts of West Nile virus in mosquitoes? Turns out that Orange County, California is a bit unique for a number of reasons, but one of those is that low-income areas have, uh, even single-track homes have in-ground swimming pools. And the first time you have any kind of home foreclosures or economic downturns, guess what gets abandoned? The swimming pools and the, and the upkeep. So you get what we call green pools or neglected pools in these backyards, and those are like orgasmic for mosquitoes. They love it. That's the perfect place for mosquito. That's where you want to raise your kids, right? <laughs> if you're a mosquito. And it turns out, I told you, it doesn't rain in Orange County, California. So birds come there to congregate. It becomes the perfect storm for West Nile virus amplification. And this brings me to a second point that I'd like you guys to think about. Talk about thinking small. If you're a high income, high per capita income uh, uh, neighborhood and you're adjacent to a low per capita income neighborhood, the mosquito doesn't know where that boundary is. It doesn't know you have nicer paint or you just put a roof on your house. It just, it, it can fly anywhere, up to three kilometers, some of these mosquitoes. So it behooves the whole community to say, hey, there's foreclosed homes next door. Or, hey, th there's no upkeep in these swimming pools. Let's call somebody and make sure that that community becomes a healthier community, rather than just letting everyone fend for themselves. All right. So you as individuals, what can you do? I, this is the most ridiculously easy thing to think about. Start searching Google in a better fashion. 
And if there's anybody in Google that sees this, come ask me about why, how I think this could happen. But here's a little app called Google Trends. And what you can do in Google Trends is you put in any term you want. This is a cool thing, right? My students love this all the time. And they're on their tablets like already typing. And I'm like, not yet, not yet. <laughs> you can put any term into Google Trends and find out how often it's searched. So here's an example of West Nile virus and how often it's searched. Uh, you can see there's a cyclical pattern there, right? There's spikes. That spike corresponds to the first case of West Nile virus every season. So every time you hear, oh, there's a case in Orange County, California, oh, okay, I'm going to look that up. Or, the, or first case in Los Angeles County, I'm going to look that up. Then you could see there's a decline, sort of a waning interest in West Nile virus. That's bad because we know that it's still here. You did get a spike in 2012, which is good. People were aware of it because it was a big outbreak year. But then shortly thereafter, 2013, it drops back down to levels where, okay, it's not that big a deal. I don't know why this is. Is West Nile virus not exotic enough? It's real exotic. Believe me, if you get it, you'll be like, wow, this is exotic. This is an exotic <laughs> disease. Here's West Nile virus compared to Ebola. So that's an exotic disease. Okay, there's some interest in Ebola while there was West Nile virus. Not real sure why, because there were zero cases of Ebola. So that's, I mean, it's cool to know about that stuff, but you're not at risk for Ebola pre-2014. And then you see a huge spike in 2014 because we had the big Ebola outbreak last year. Okay, great. The fact is, one person died in the US from Ebola. Over 2,000 people have died from West Nile virus in the United States from West Nile virus. So you're, you're 2,000 times more likely to get one disease over another, and yet the search volume is about equal for these. But listen, I'm an optimist. I was glass half full. Okay, it's cool. People are still looking at diseases. That's great. No, it's not that great. Because look, what if you do a search... <laughs> can we... I mean... Oh, it's so, so depressing, right? Like, I'm a believer. Don't, don't get me wrong. But you can't... Stop. stop. We cut the shit. Start searching in a more intelligent fashion, okay? That's another take-home message. All right, last slide. I told you, I showed you the scary, you know, uh, global transport of diseases, right? TSA is not screening for any kind of diseases right now, so you're kind of on your own. And it seems scary, the fact that those things are able to move around so much. But what moves around even faster than those diseases or has the opportunity to? This is Facebook in January of 2004. Again, the video's not broken. There was no Facebook in January of 2004. <laughs> In the last 10 years of human history, here's how our information network has, has changed. This is Facebook as of January 2014. And this is just Facebook, right? Not Google, not Wikipedia, not any other search engines. It's just one metric. But this is how connected people are in terms of information. If you wanted to find out about a disease in Africa 100 years ago, how did you do it? You waited until a, thousands of people died from it, or hundreds of thousands, before it made news. And now you can find out if one person dies of Ebola in Africa and know what the disease symptoms are and how it's transported and what transports it. So my last message to you guys is stop spreading diseases and start spreading information. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Okay.